from Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Department. And my good buddy is with me today, Captain Nick Morgato, assigned to our training bureau. And he's going to be weighing in on some of the, um, the influences that uh, the, the tests in research and modern fire dynamics uh, that has been, been conducted by Underwriters Laboratory, NIST, that's the National Institute for Standards and Training, and ATF, uh, three of my favorite things, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, has impacted the fire service in general, but specifically, specifically our fire department, the Miami-Dade Fire Department. And Nick is in a unique position to talk about that because he is his specialty is in-service training, training veteran firefighters, and we all know it's a heck of a lot different than training uh, uh, recruits. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Key Fire Hose. That's keyfire.com. Uh, it's an easy endorsement for me uh, because that's what my company uses, Key Hose. Uh, I think it has the best balance of durability, heat and abrasion, abrasion resistance, and phenomenal kink resistance. Uh, when you're considering changing from a high pressure nozzle that would typically operate at 100 psi to a lower pressure nozzle that say operates at 75 or uh, 50 psi uh, with the same size lines uh, you have the potential for kinks due to a lower pressure in the hose lines so when you're considering uh, the lower pressure nozzles consider hose like key that has excellent kink resistance even at extremely low pressures. So I've been a captain on Miami-Dade Fire Department for 37 years and in the fire service beginning in Chicago uh, since 1973. So that's 42 years on the job. Nick, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and then we're going to uh, uh, turn the program over to um, Clark Lamping for him to make his introduction. Absolutely. Thank you, Bill. Uh, like the captain said, uh, Nick Morgado. Sorry, Nick Morgado. I've been on for uh, 13 years. I've been a company officer since 2007, and I've been assigned to the training division as a training captain for the past uh, four years. And the apple does not fall far from the tree. Uh, Nick's dad passed away from uh, job-related cancer. I had the distinct honor of working for him as a, as a firefighter and as a company officer when uh, Nick's dad was a battalion chief. So uh, he's following in his father's footsteps as I am following in my father's footsteps, and as we will see very shortly, another young man is following in his foot father's footsteps as well, and he will get a chance to introduce himself. So uh, to, I think it will be my immediate right, is that correct, Clark Lamping from Clark County, Nevada. Clark, you've got, uh, go ahead with your introduction, and you've got a few announcements to make, I understand. Good morning, everybody. It is still morning here on the West Coast. Uh, like the good captain said, my name is Clark Lamping. I'm a training captain with the Clark County Fire Department out here in Las Vegas. And as I say, every single every single hangout we have, if anyone ever visits Las Vegas, please look me up, and I'll buy you the first beer. All right, I've got a couple uh, got a couple shout outs to make. Now I'm usually a very private person, but uh, I had a real my family had a real traumatic experience. My brother, my only brother, passed away two weeks ago. Uh, it was really very tragic. And the reason I'm sharing this is because it happened in Pasadena, California, Southern California. And because uh, I was not the next of kin, the coroner would not give me any information. They insisted on dealing with my brother's 19-year-old son. Um, so what I did is uh, I made some phone calls to some brothers in Southern California, and I eventually got in touch with a battalion chief in Pasadena, California, called me up, and we spoke, and he put me in touch with the company that actually ran on my brother and uh, after that they got word to the fire chief. Now mind you the battalion chief and the firefighter that I talked to I'd never met before. I do know the fire chief of Pasadena. He got word he was in a meeting and he got word via text. The fire chief of Pasadena left a meeting, walked out of the meeting and made a phone call to me to see if I was alright and see if the Pasadena fire department could do anything to help me out and it was just unbelievable. For the next week, the battalion chief and that firefighter who ran on my brother texted me every single day for seven days to see if I was all right and to see if I needed anything, and had never met these people before. So uh, I got to throw a shout-out to the Pasadena Fire Department. It's a small fire department. What an exceptional bunch of people. What, what an exceptional bunch of brothers. I owe them a lot. So 
that's one of my announcements. Uh, my other announcement is, I don't know if anyone's visited Las Vegas recently, but we have the Riviera Hotel. The Riviera Hotel was just sold, and the Las Vegas Visitor and Convention Authority bought the hotel. They are allowing us to train in this hotel for six months. So uh, from November 7th through 11th, we're going to have a conference, a uh, national conference at the Riviera Hotel. Uh, we're going to post the details here pretty soon as soon as we make some, make some arrangements. Um, it is going to be high-rise firefighting, mid-rise firefighting. We are going to do destructive training in this building. We have 2,100 rooms. We can force doors. We can flow water down hallways. I don't know if we're going to have live fire. Probably not, but we've got some heavy hitters from across the country going to come in and help us instruct. And if you ever want to break stuff or flow water inside a high-rise, you should come to Las Vegas for this convention. It's going to be run through the Terry Farrell Foundation, the Nevada chapter. Check them out on Facebook and on the Internet. Uh, and if you've got any questions, post a, post a note on the Terry Farrell Foundation. Nevada chapter's website will answer any questions. Excellent, Clark. Uh, excellent. And um, I appreciate the invitation. Uh, I will be instructing there, uh, as will Nick. And um, it's, that's really what a wonderful opportunity. And I'm so glad that your, uh, your department is seizing that opportunity. All right, to your uh, would be your immediate right, I believe, I, and I get my right and left mixed up here because I'm my screen's different than yours. But it would be my ball, my other bald-headed brother, uh, uh, Dan. If you'd go ahead and make your introduction. Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, Dan Shaw, I'm a battalion chief of Fairfax County Fire and Rescue in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, been in this position for just about a year now. Um, and just really uh, glad to join the conversation. Always look good. To look forward to this live the conversation, especially talking some tactics today and some uh, taking signs to the street per se. Oh, real, real good, real good. And then we've got the uh, the Hovelman boys, young Hovelman and uh, the older Hovelman. And uh, what's your son's name again, Jason? Braden. Braden. Okay. All right. Well, you guys go ahead and introduce yourself. And uh, this is the father and son duo, and like I say, this just warms my heart because this is how I started off in the fire service, how Nick started off in the fire service, uh, because our fathers were firefighters. So you're upholding a great tradition. So you go ahead and uh, make some introductions there, both gentlemen. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jason Hovelman, and I'm a battalion chief in Florissant uh, as a career battalion chief. And then uh, I've been involved with my volunteer department for 30 years now. I started as a junior firefighter 30 years ago, and I'm fortunate enough today to introduce my son, Braden, who's 13, his first day as a junior firefighter here in Sullivan. And uh, any, any words of wisdom on your first day? Uh, it's first day, interesting to get my gear, but, you know, only took us about 30 pairs of pants to get me some. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> so I thought, what better than in the tune them in and listen to the legends of the fire service here? So uh, thanks for letting them join. He's got. Hey, Braden, have they listen. sent you out to look for the hose stretcher yet? Nope. <laughs> after, after the seminar, yeah, better go look. Find that hose stretcher. We're going to need it today. All right. All right. <laughs> hey, we got our Mike, brother Mike Dugan from the FDNY. Mike, if you go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, Mike's muted, and uh, there we go, Mike. All right, we're going to go talk about Ryan. Are you with us, Ryan? Yes, sir. My name is oh. Ryan. Uh, hello. <laughs> Thanks for enjoying or uh, let me join you guys today. My name is Ryan Pennington. I'm a firefighter paramedic from Charleston, West Virginia, and over the past four years, I've been studying fires that occur in compulsive hoarding disorder homes. So it's uh, we just got finished doing some research burns, and I'm excited to share with the panel today. Excellent. Excellent. And I think that's going to fall right in line with what we're talking about in terms of uh, the research on modern fire dynamics. Mike Dugan, do we have you? Are you with us now, sir? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start with the program here. And uh, what I want to do is to talk a little bit about uh, fire research. And then we're going to open the panel up for a discussion on how, to what extent, your department has embraced uh, the findings of this UL NIST and ATF research. Uh, has they adopted? Have they adopted any in their uh, their tactics and strategies? Uh, and how are you teaching your recruit firefighters and uh, 
veteran firefighters these new techniques. Let me share something here with you for a minute if I could. Now, uh, I'm going to hold this up and uh, can everybody... Oh, excellent. Good. All right. This is the model. Whoop, whoop, whoop. There we go. Of a fire that would be would have ample ventilation. In other words, years ago, fires would consume fuel before it would consume the oxygen. So the reason that this fire decays is that the fuel has been consumed. That is not representative of the types of fires we are seeing in today's modern fire environment because of two factors. Petrochemical-based materials burn with a voracious appetite for oxygen, and uh, the buildings are so airtight, almost literally airtight, due to energy efficiency. So this is a revised graph, and uh, it represents, oh, there we go, it represents a fire that may very well reach a uh, flashover, and then it becomes underventilated. And remember that human beings and, and fires have about the same oxygen requirement. If you drop down much below 21%, let's say 18% oxygen, human beings get loopy and fires diminish in intensity to the point that uh, there may not, the temperature reduction may be uh, significant enough to not even push smoke out of the building anymore. Now, when firefighters vent, or when they op make an opening, I'm not talking about a ventilation cutting a hole in a roof, I'm just talking about opening a door. Oxygen flows into that opening and mixes with unburned fire gases, and that fire will intensify. Now, this is representative of a rapid intensification when the opening is made, but research has indicated that that intensification may not be that rapid it may be something similar to this where yes you have ignition, you have flashover, you have a ventilation deprived or uh, oxygen uh, deprived fire and then there's that flat line, that horizontal line and I say that varies, it varies on a lot of factors which Rick, uh, Nick is going to allude to and then when the firefighters make the opening, the fire can intensify. Now, there's a lot of variables here, and I think it's very important to realize that both of these, both of these graphs are accurate as long as they are representing the proper conditions. And Nick, if you would just go ahead and just explain some of the, uh, some of the conditions that uh, some we can control and some we cannot control that would determine that length between the time we make the opening and the time that the fire intensifies. Uh, yeah, sure, Bill. I'll miss a uh, sorry. I'll mention a few uh, a few examples and some variables, and I'm sure there are plenty more that the uh, the panel will allude to. But uh, obviously, one is probably going to be the size of the fire prior prior to going uh, vent limited, and uh, how much heat that generated, and how much uh, potential is still there. Uh, obviously, the location of the fire in relationship or relation to that vent opening, whether it's on the same level, level below, or perhaps a level uh, up or on the second floor, um, as well as uh, this distance on that level from, uh, from the vent opening. Uh, the interior arrangement of the building itself, uh, if it's a residential, depending on its building construction and when it was actually built, you know, may have open floor plans, or the floor plans may be uh, you know, a little more closed off with walls and doors. Um, as well as obviously the windows uh, when the, when that construction was uh, when the when the house was made and the window construction type you know if it's older windows they may last a little longer than the newer ones and then down here we have impact and hurricane glass which uh, which will obviously uh, last a little bit longer um, so those are some of the things that we may not know or may not be able to control uh, some of the things that we can control obviously is the amount of air that may be released into that atmosphere when we do open up the building itself. Uh, obviously, the size of that vent, uh, that vent, uh, that vent hole, whether it's the door or if it's a window failing. Um, so we can keep it maybe in that uh, that vent limited state. Uh, we can control the door, maybe put up a draft curtain to go ahead and uh, control some of that air movement into the building itself. Um, and also the arrangement inside will also uh, have a factor on how fast that fire may reintensify. Um, obviously, uh, if we have a vent point, the fire will intensify. But if that vent point is ins uh, insufficient, the fire will only grow so fast. Well, the same can be said, obviously, about the flow path itself. You can have a large vent point, but if the flow path 
uh, with inside that structure is limited, only so much air is going to go ahead and reach uh, reach the fire. And again, that could be the interior arrangement. Uh, fuel loading and content may also play a factor into that as well. Uh, Ryan, uh, you're specializing or you're studying, uh, Ryan Pennington, uh, hoarder fires. And both Nick and I uh, came to the conclusion that a hoarder fire would also uh, probably follow this time temperature curve because of the amount of fuel in relation to the oxygen that, and I've seen this in my own experience, and I'm going to show you some pictures here shortly, but I think a hoarder fire, particularly if it's loaded with petrochemical based materials, is a classic example of where you're going to have an extremely fuel rich atmosphere that's going to take longer for that fire to re-intensify after the firefighters make the opening. Well, <laughs> where do I start? You got about eight hours. So, so Bill, we, we went down to the Kill the Flashover project down in Shelby, North Carolina, and they gave me a hoarding house to burn for eight hours. And you are spot on, absolutely spot on. So we, it, what people don't know is the hoarding, there's actually levels. So level one, two, three, four, and five. We burned in levels three and above. So burn 7.7-1 7 that we completed had zero vent openings, none, no windows, no doors. And from time ignition in two spots, so we're burning real fuels. This is a research burn. It's not a, it's not a 1403 burn. We had to have couches, cushions, matches, a ton of Christmas trees, <laughs> the synthetic Christmas trees. It went from zero to 1230 in like two minutes. And something that was phenomenal, it went from 1230 back down to 180 degrees in another two minutes. If we would not have opened that door, if we would not have opened that door, fire's out, completely out. And then how long did it take for the fire to intensify? You open that door, you better have her, you better have her packed and ready, boys. Because when as soon as we opened that door, you could see the gases swirling and swirling. And then we did something which he alluded to earlier that I'd never used before. We hung the smoke curtain. We worked it with with the, with what uh, Lloyd Lehman or whoever it's called the called smoke plug. So we were working in that dead space area, and the firefighters only experienced temperatures of 140 degrees. Let me share these. Let me share these pictures with you here, fellas. Um, this is what inspired me to start looking into this and, and change this curve. Uh, this is a fire, fellas and ladies, that uh, appeared a day after Thanksgiving in a closed up warehouse about 600 feet by 200 feet deep. Not much smoke showing, but day after Thanksgiving, and we knew that the building was, uh, was closed up tight and tight. It's a mattress factory. All right, so the boys start going, working on the door. Whoop, 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 whoop. There we go. The boys start working on the doors, on the overhead doors with the, with the saws. Now, this chief has got a heck of a lot of experience, and he knew what the potential would be. Even though we didn't have much smoke showing, and we didn't have much pressure, when these doors were cut and subsequently raised, there was not a rapid intensification of the fire. It took a few minutes. Why? Because of the size of the building and that the fire was remote from the opening. You actually had a reversal of smoke and again this took well over 200 seconds. And then what happened here is eventually we awakened a sleeping dragon. Now this particular chief has got a great philosophy. He says there's two types of fires we're going to go to, gentlemen and ladies. There are the fires that we are going to make entry and go to the fire and fight the fire. There are other fires that we are going to allow the fire to come to us and fight it on our terms. This was one of those fires that we allowed it to come to us rather than awaken a sleeping dragon deep into the building. This whole issue of ventilation limited fires and the time it's going to take for them to intensify begs the question. You advance a hose line into any building. What's going to reach the fire first? You with water on that hose line or the oxygen that's flowing in behind you? So fellows, it, what I'd like to do now is, is uh, we'll kind of open up the discussion. Uh, if your department has embraced, uh, if they are adopting some of these new practices that we've learned through research, uh, I'd like them to share, 
I'd like you to share it with the audience if you could. Clark, we'll start off with you, sir. Well, <clears throat> my department has not officially embraced, we don't have any official policies on door control, on uh, exterior water application. Um, we do not have any smoke curtains. No one, uh, we haven't even trained on smoke curtains. I have used a smoke curtain when I was down in Mafsi in uh, Georgia last year, two years ago. But as aside of that, we have no official uh, implementation of these new NIOSH findings. But we do have many, many people on the job. Our heavy hitters, our front runners, are doing the research themselves. And I have captains on the job without the direction of the battalion chief or the incident commander are using door control, are using exterior water application through windows with smooth bore nozzles. So it is where the, bubble, the bubbles are boiling from the bottom. They're boiling from the bottom. And just uh, as a, in the training division, we had, uh, we had some training that the officers had to do on fair hiring practices, right? One of those really exciting classes that the, the government makes us take. Um, so I took all the firefighters and engineers, I put them in a room and I put one of the NIOSH videos in. Or the, I'm sorry, the NIST videos in, and that was a 90-minute video, just exceptional, exceptional video, and it's one of the ones we've all seen. Uh, but out of every single class, I had three or four guys come up to me and say, "Hey, wow, this is great! How how old is this stuff? Or we've never seen this before, or why haven't we heard about this stuff?" So, one of the problems I'm having is we still, our guys still just won't get on the computer, and instead of googling whatever they're looking for, they're not googling fire strategies, they're not googling fire behavior. And I told these guys, this stuff's been on the computer for years. It's no secret. It's no secret. At some point, we've got to tell these guys, go out and get that information yourselves. We're going to bubble this. We're going to boil this pot from the bottom. And eventually, the chiefs and the upper chiefs are going to have enough guys on the job doing this that they're going to have to take notice. And, uh, and then they're going to have to take some action. Um, one resource that I use a lot is uh, the Los Angeles County Fire Department. They are very, very forward-thinking department under the training direction of Chief Alconis. Um, they've, uh, years ago, they received a grant from a film company, and they have professionally filmed and edited videos for training videos for firefighters. So get on YouTube and, and Google uh, some of the door control, the flow path control training videos, and these are videos that the training division filmed and sent out to the guys on the floor on how they are now doing door control. Um, their most senior guy on the crew is now at the door with a tool, and he's, he's in charge of door control. That's how important they think it is that the senior man stays at the door and monitors the door. So that's, that's another great resource that I've been using in the training division to disseminate some of this information. Excellent. Uh, Dan, Dan Shaw from Fairfax. Yeah. How about your department? Um, you know, fortunately, uh, we've been uh, taking a lot of the information and using it uh, and directly applying it to our strategy and tactics. I mean, our, our basic firefighters, when they come out of recruit school, we still teach the same curriculum, which means that, uh, like every other firefighter in the country, all they're getting is four hours of fire behavior training when they're in recruit school. Uh, now, we're, a, we're an operations manual-driven department, uh, and I'm fortunate enough to serve as a chair of that committee that writes that for all of Northern Virginia. And what we did in, in uh, our manuals are very similar to New York City's in that we first start off with our occupancy type manuals. So we have a townhouse manual, single family dwelling manual. Uh, and where we chose to really implement a lot of this technology and put the focus back on what Clark's saying is that once you come out of recruit school and you're in the field, where do you find this information? Well, we put out our engine company manual, which was all about engine company operations. And one of the strongest parts of that manual is the fire behavior portion, uh, in which we're really focusing on uh, people understanding exactly what you showed in that graph and what that means, explaining the why, which we're horrible at in the fire service, is explaining the why and why that's important. But there's some other things tactically that we fed into it. Uh, for instance, you don't take the windows on a fire in Fairfax unless you communicate to the engine officer who's in the room, where you see the telltale signs that they've they have a knock on the fire. They don't communicate back through me in the incident command post. It's to the engine officer, the outside vent guy in the truck coming. He'll usually call, the engine officer usually call him and say, all right, take the windows. And we're, we're, we're kind of still learning from that because I think we underventilate some fires because we've seen what happens when we overventilate. But we're working through that. Uh, the, the implementation of the lap. You know, every fire we go to, either that engine officer's taking a lap or uh, every third engine on a fire in Fairfax gives a side Charlie report. 
And then we have EMS officers who show up who can go take a lap. For instance, my aide goes around with an iPad and takes a picture of the four sides of the building and brings it back to the command post and then sits it right up on my dash. So I can look at all four sides of the structure and see what exactly the guys tell me on the back. But when we, those guys are taking a lap, what we're telling them is looking for key things like figure out where the fire is. So going back to your original point that you uh, offered in the very beginning was, is your stream going to get to that fire before the oxygen gets there before you force entry? You won't know unless you know actually where the seat of the fire is. If we're just walking in, crawling around, trying to find a fire and spraying on smoke, then yeah, the oxygen is going to get there quicker and now the fire is going to greet you. But if we know where the fire is, he finishes that lap and then he makes a tactical decision, that first engine officer, as to where he's going to put that hose line because he knows where the fire is, he knows the way it's going to vent, he knows where he's going to, you know, the exhaust and intake essentially are. And a lot of that's breaking the mentality of what we teach in our, our recruit schools across the country that everything's in modules. So we teach that, you know, forcible entry and then you teach search and rescue. And we don't teach that forcible entry is ventilation. So when you open that seven foot by three foot front door, which is 21 square feet of ventilation, you vented the structure. So we have to be weary of how we're doing it. So we implemented it across the board. Uh, just in our operations manual, our field training se section, much like what Nick does. I mean, those guys do a fantastic job of training 1,700 firefighters uh, of implementing a lot of this stuff. Uh, now, the, the great thing is I talked about our field training and our fire and rescue academy. Uh, they are really the, the catalyst for what we're changing in 1403. I serve on a 1400 committee, uh, and myself, um, Eddie Buchanan, and Dan from NIST are all in the subcommittee for 1403. And we're really changing 1403 on a national level to reflect a lot of this. And that 1403 was originally written because we were doing structure fires and guys were dying in live acquired structures, which is, you know, there's no excuse for you. It's undefensible. So those, you know, the people who put 1403 together did due diligence in putting together a standard that really said, hey, don't go outside these lines so we don't kill anyone in these fires. But we really didn't define the purpose of what a 1403 burn was. And that's what we're changing with 1403. Hopefully, uh, I think in October we get back together in Dallas, is taking what we did in Fairfax to say that the 1403 burns have nothing to do with assessing firefighter skills. They're not about throwing uh, ladders, stretching hose lines. They should be all about fire behavior. And taking that opportunity to demonstrate, all right, what do you want to do? You pick from the laundry list. Let's have Let's show flashover. So let's take it from vent limited to flashing it over. We're not putting anyone in the compartment, but we're, they're, they're going to see what happens. And that's what these guys did uh, with our, our exceptional field training staff was, you know, it was one of the compelling arguments I used for making this change is we took a two-story single-family dwelling, and these guys took a, a, essentially a one room, no furnishings, with, uh, you know, five or six pallets and some hay, and had that fire just solely by controlling the windows go from just light smoke like you showed in your video or your pictures to fire blowing out of six windows in less than two minutes. But then also can demonstrate, hey, if you hit it, you're short staffed and you decide, hey, I can't make the push because it's five turns to make the back bedroom. If they hit it from the outside and applied seven seconds of water, they got a quality knockdown, then they can make the push, like I said before, to get back to the seat of the fire and understand it. And what we're trying to do, whether it's on a national level or just here in Fairfax, is making sure, you know, our, we treat our manuals like they're legacy documents. So taking from knowledge of guys like you and, and Mike uh, and, and taking what you learn in your years of experience and parlaying into what it, we're applying now in modern tactics so that when we're all gone, someone can look at it and say, okay, I see exactly what they're getting at. Was, we're trying to explain the why. Why we did what we did when... You guys got in the fire service, what we did when I got in the fire service in the 90s, to what we do now. There's a reason for why we would do, and we have to explain that reason, and we're hoping to capture that a lot through the documents we have, but also the training to reinforce that. Uh, that's excellent. Uh, the other point uh, I want to make is that uh, the idea of the iPad, uh, with your aide going around taking the pictures on the other sides that you don't see, is a great idea. I think you're going to be seeing an article on that in Fire Engineering. It'll be written by Bill Gustin. Uh, 
<laughs> but it will, you will see one very soon, very soon in fire engineering. Mr. Hovelmans, the Hovelmans, would you like to weigh in on this? How has this research affected your departments? Yeah, we've the last last summer actually uh, we decided to uh, incorporate a lot of those videos as formal training assignments. Um, with, with we thought the summer was a good time to really attack that issue uh, with the heat and. Uh, with the collective bargaining agreement that we have with some of the heat restrictions, it was a good opportunity to get guys familiar with all of the information that was coming out because, like Clark had said, not everybody was familiar with it. And uh, they were mandatory assignments. It was, it was assigned uh, to them every month, a uh, different video from NIST. Uh, they had to watch the ATF video from the Mark Falcon hand line of duty death. There was a lot of things that we, that we used. We've not made official changes to our policies or operational guidelines yet, but we have started to incorporate some of the individual components. Um, we we really hit back. Uh, we really hit. <laughs> we really we really uh, hit the size up. Uh, really changing uh, how we do the size up and making it more thorough. And then one thing we've really concentrated on with our first two companies is. Uh, the utilization of our ambulance crews to get more people on the first line and having some tactical patience uh, when they when they do their 360 before they deploy before they open the door and uh, and then we've also practiced in this, especially the the larger buildings uh, moving the hose line while we flow and having that engine officer watch the conditions on the interior as we move. Very good, Mike. Are you with us now? I think so. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Mike. Okay, finally got my microphone issue figured out. Um, the FDNY has bought into this uh, hook, line, and sinker, but I think the issue for us is that it's like what I call the hazmat answer. It depends. It depends on the fire. It depends on the situation. It depends on is if, as Ryan said, it's a hoarding incident. It depends on if it's a ventilated limited fire or it's already out the windows. It depends on if there are people that have to be rescued. And every one of those is a different tactic. And we, our people have always been good at determining the tactics, as Dan said, to the building type because our private dwelling operations differ from our multiple dwellings, from our commercial structures, and all of those things. And I think the whole idea of this is a great thing, but what happens in the fire service, unfortunately, as Clark said, as Jason said, some people haven't seen this stuff, and they don't buy into it. And then somebody comes in and sees one video, and they're going to change the way everything is done. And that is not correct. The science, the studies, their tools to go in our toolbox, if we have this type of incident, a ventilated limited fire, okay, where it's all enclosed, as in your taxpayer, these are going to be things that we are going to take into account. The building was closed. It was the day after Thanksgiving. It was a Friday morning. You knew it had been closed the night before. The life hazard was very, very limited as far as civilians. The only life hazard is going to be our firefighters. So all of these things have to go into that command decision. And our whole idea is to look at these things and make these tactics work on that situation. What is the number one? Is there a life hazard besides our firefighters, which is always a life hazard to us? But is there a civilian life hazard? Is there reports of somebody trapped? If there is reports of somebody trapped, we are not going to keep the door. We're not going to not force the door and make that oxygen opening. We're going to try to restrict it. Once we force it, get in there. We're going to try to close it. And we've done that for years. Um, you know, people think this hitting it hard from the yard is a new t tactic. Bill, I heard you talking about this in the 90s at FDIC, about if you don't have enough people, hit it from the outside. It's not a new tactic. It's just a tactic. People are refreshing our ideas on what we're doing, and we should be students of the game and have an idea of what we're going to do. Ryan talks about hoarding fires. I've had a couple of hoarding fires. We start crawling into the structure, and before you know it, you're crawling up because there's so much crap. You think you're on the floor, and you're three or four feet off the floor. Now the heat dropping down, the stratification of heat, has nowhere to go, so you're in a much higher in heat environment. So all of these things are going to be part of your individual company and total fire size up. 
and everyone's doing that and everyone should have an idea of what they are going to do at this fire by the conditions they see and I've always said it they say it now because of terrorism if you see something say something I don't care if you're the newest guy in a fire service okay you could be Jason's kid who's standing outside as a junior firefighter looking and say did you see the color of that smoke it looks purple over there Ooh, wait a second that's something weird we don't normally see that maybe there's something going on here we're gonna reevaluate everyone should be empowered to say something if they see something at a fire you're, you're so right and I, Mike I've said this before uh, about the FDN one thank God for the FDN one if a department that big with that much tradition not much pride in esprit de corps can take a hard constructive look at the way they operate in light of this research and say hey maybe there are some things that we can change maybe the way that we've been doing things for 150 years maybe there is some time for some changes in tactics and strategy if a department like the FDNY can do it then there's no department in this country that has an excuse for not visiting it and in terms of hitting the fire from the outside my dad 33 years on the Chicago Fire Department with uh, always on a busy company told me early in my career Bill don't be afraid to give a fire a dash from the outside if your interior attack is delayed for whatever reason wind complexity in the building staffing uh, burglar bars other forcible entry issues uh, and Bill Bill when you do that dash from the outside I hope you're using key hose to do that. Well, that's and you're exactly going to look at our you're going to look at our friends at keyfire.com and say thank you for sponsoring this, but I hope you're using your key fire hose to do that. Well, this is what I suggest. If you're in the market for buying new hose, go to keyfire.com and go to some competitors and lay your hose out in an S in a hallway that's say 3 feet 3 feet wide and charge those lines and see how they react and I think it's a great uh, you'll see it's a great example under realistic conditions of the kink resistance of your hose and see how quickly the kinks come out of both brands and I'm very confident you'll find that you're, you're not going to find any brand that is more kink resistant than uh, than key uh, Ryan would you like to weigh in on this a little bit sir sure uh, you guys ready for my spiel on it yes sir all right, By the so way, all firemen are at least level two hoarders. Okay. <laughs> Just keep that in well, if, if I would take my camera and, and pan it around my office, you'd see a bunch of uh, fire books and Steelers memorabilia, so you're probably right. So here in my home area, there's three levels of this research. It's, it's something that you can do at the individual level, something you bring at the company level, and our chiefs are still, we're still introducing it to them. Number one, we got to give a huge shout out to the ISFSI as they're bringing the slicers class to our home area, and I think they've almost got the the class field at 150 registrants. So that's that's a huge step in the right direction. So on top of that, you've got people like me, and, and I like to refer uh, refer to myself as the Kool Aid man because I'm drinking all of it. I've got two gallons of this Kool Aid that I'm drinking. I'm obsessed with fire science. I've been exposed to something that I had no clue existed in the fire service. Now, just like Captain Dugan said a minute ago, what surprised me was the person that I hear come up, whose name comes up the most, just so happens that he was the fire chief about an hour north in little old West Virginia, and that was Lloyd Lehman. Mm -hmm. So it, continuing what Lloyd Lehman's research was over, I don't know, 40-some years ago, it's really interesting. And being exposed to this science, I want to know more in – I, I really have to echo Captain Dugan. It's like if you bring us back to the firehouse, you say, hey, this has got to go, this has got to go, this has got to go. They're going to run you out on a spit. I mean, they're just going to freaking throw you out of the firehouse. It's breaking it down into digestible chunks. And you really have to consider all the variables. Where's the flow path from? Where's the intake from? Where's the exhaust from? What's your staffing? What's your level? All these things come into play. But now what you don't have to figure in is different points of view. And I'm going to throw this out there. I'm obsessed with learning the European model and why and where they do things in comparison to us. So bringing that information slowly into and, and, and rowing the boat is something I'm working on. Uh, you would be surprised how many people are willing to accept what you bring into it. 
the, the running joke with the guys from New Jersey told me that uh, I ride on an ambulance. Uh, every other shift I have, I'm assigned to an ambulance. And they said, I can see it now. Ryan's going to show up with a smoke curtain, a dry chem extinguisher, and make the rescue before the first engine gets there. And when the chief rolls up and the fire's out, has no clue what's going on. <laughs> so it's exciting. It's an exciting time. All this information from the ISFSIs out there, it's all free. So I would encourage all the, the street level to the chiefs to get on board. Uh, you mentioned the Europeans. Uh, we have a lot of visitors from Germany. Uh, that come to our, our, our firehouse and ride with us. And we are becoming more European in terms of our tactics than the Europeans are becoming Americanized. Uh, for instance, they think we're crazy to go into a multiple dwelling and force a perfectly intact door and contaminate an otherwise tenable hallway. They'll send a company with a hose line to that doorway, but they'll keep the door closed and then they'll get their METS aerial ladder and zip up there and go in through, knock the fire down through a window and step inside. Uh, the smoke control curtain originated in Germany. Uh, also, you got to give them credit, Ryan. They're fighting fire with a heck of a lot water, less water than we have because they just don't have it. So they've got to make every drop count. Uh, Nick, I'm going to ask you now. You're in a unique situation. You're you're in in service training, training veteran firefighters, which is a challenge. It's easier to train recruits than it is veterans, uh, because they're going to want to know why. Uh, can you talk about some of the things that you're trying to introduce when you have companies come in into the training center? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And that why is uh, is is very important, and I'll, and I'll get to that in a second. But. Uh, you know, first I want to I want to say that uh, one of the easiest things or the best thing for us is that we absolutely have the support of uh, of our training chief as far as you know uh, supporting us as far as incorporating this into our uh, into our, our drills and evolutions and also into our classes. So without without their support, it it really wouldn't go nowhere because there would be obviously some backlash. Um, before we get into our, our in service, um, we have integrated the uh, the, the latest uh, information and uh, and, and uh, knowledge into our recruit class. As you mentioned, we have, we have a recruit class in going uh, right now, and they did the search yesterday. And uh, Lieutenant Javier was uh, talking about flow paths and closing the door and then or search and, and all that. And that's all all incorporated into there. Uh, it's also incorporated into our officer development program through the uh, strategy and tactics class that, uh, that that you teach, as well as the incident command class that we do as well. Um, and uh, and not getting into the in-service, and that's it's definitely a uh, I want to say a delicate situation. But you're dealing with with guys who have experience, and their experience may possibly counter uh, some of the things that we may be uh, uh, presenting to them. And I think Ryan, you really hit it on the head as far as uh, putting giving it to them in manageable manageable doses. Uh, one of the great tools that, that we found uh, through social media and through our email chain is to uh, get this information out and put it in their hands, even though we can't make it uh, make them read it. Uh, you put, they give the information to them. They're a little more, a uh, little more receptive as opposed to putting them in a class and telling them that this is the way it is. And that's definitely not the way that uh, that we want to present something because we want it to be received. Uh, but we do incorporate it in our hands-on evolutions, and we incorporate it into our our classroom uh, classroom uh, lectures as as well. And uh, so from time to time, we we do get the uh, the guy that doesn't want to hear it. Then. I don't say emotions get high, but they, they tend to get real defensive, and that's not the environment for it. And we typically talk to them afterward, and we kind of we kind of move on, and we'll we'll try to present them with as much information as possible to to explain why. And usually the why is where we get the best buy-in. It's it's kind of building up to the change. You know, this is what we're seeing. This is why we want to do this, and this is what we're going to do. And we tend to uh, tend to get a good response from that. And then uh, one of the biggest things, and we kind of—I mentioned this to you this earlier, and you mentioned this uh, two months ago in the, in the hangout that we did—that uh, we received a grant to do the fire officer one and fire officer two courses. Um, and a lot of this information is contained uh, within those programs. And since it didn't come from us, uh, it, it was well received, and we're starting to hear these uh, terms on the, on the radio. We're seeing pictures on Facebook uh, as far as you know door control and and uh, and transitional resetting the fire before before making entry. So it's it's starting to take uh, it's starting to take a little bit of a hold. Because the people that come from other departments to teach to our department, Nick, are experts because they came from more than ten miles away. See, I'm just a schmo on my department, but when I go to somebody else's department, that makes me the expert. That's just the way it is. But they're hearing it seriously. You are hearing it from a different point of view. Yeah, and it makes a difference. It makes. It seems to make a difference. 
Hey, You're never a prophet in your own land, uh, Captain Gustin. There you go. There you go. I want to mention something else, fellas, uh, and it has to do with networking. Mike, Mike Dugan was talking about how important it is to get on the internet and uh, avail yourself to the plethora of information that's out there. Uh, I derive great joy by networking with my brothers and sisters in the fire service, and I got to give a shout out to uh, Dave Walsh. He's the program chair of the fire science curriculum at uh, Dutchess Community College in Poughkeepsie, New York. This man is so generous with his information and he is one of the great minds of the fire service and I collaborated with Dave uh, along with several other people and including Nick on this uh, modified time temperature curve and um, one thing that Dave brought up and I'm going to show the curves again because he had a very very good suggestion and what he said was you got to remember Bill that firefighters are very visual and they will remember the last thing you hold up so if that's it that's going to be the time temperature curve as they see it okay if this is the last one they see that's the way it's going to be so he suggested very strongly we hold them both up at the same time Mike Dugan said, depends. It depends. <laughs> it depends. First of all, it depends if you're wearing the pens, Mike. But also, it depends. Not yet, Bill. All, all, okay, all those different variables that Nick was talking about as far as the size of the opening. A lot of it depends. So that's, that's uh, I want to give uh, Dave a shout out. God bless that guy. He has been uh, so kind to me, and he is uh, he's, he's a great brother in the fire service. So if you're out there, Dave, God bless you, brother. And uh, I'm going to have you on one of these months, and um, I'll, I'll be looking forward to it. All right, I'm going to leave it open for discussion now. Does anybody have anything else that they want to add? Uh, Brian, you're up, bro. So, Nick, I have a question for you. When I came back from, from spending the time with the Swedish battalion chief, uh, we won't go into the bad impressions. We'll have that. The New Jersey doing a Swedish impression was absolutely awesome to witness. But when we brought that back, we brought some of these techniques and stuff. And one of them was the tactical 360, taking that thermal imaging camera with you and then painting the door. Some of those small incremental changes, is that easier for you to implement in your department instead of saying, come on out and we're going to hang this curtain behind it when you go in? Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, when it comes to equipment, that's obviously going to be a, uh, you know, something that's going to have to go through a testing process before it gets put on the truck. Uh, but when it comes to implementing uh, techniques, uh, things to look for, um, you call it a tactical 360. Uh, we call it an interactive 360. I think either way, it's pretty much we're talking the same thing. We pretty much have free reign to uh, incorporate a lot of these into, uh, into our, uh, our drills, into our evolutions, and, uh, and, uh, and into, obviously into the department. Uh, the problem being, there's only three training captains, and we got 1,800 guys on the line. So it's getting this information in a in a consistent manner across the board and being widely accepted is uh has been difficult. But we've been at this for at least the past four years with the same guys, and we're starting to uh, to see some changes. And a lot of this has been you know help from from outside sources as well. So and it's just you know it's just it time it uh, change takes time. There we go. That's what I was that's what I was trying to say. You know, I also Clark, go ahead, Mike. I also think it's uh, incumbent on all of us, anyone who's a leader in the fire service, to think outside of the box. Uh, when we got new thermal imaging cameras in the FDNY, we got the smaller ones, and they were a lot easier for the officer. They were on a lanyard, so you could hang them on your code on your SCBA. And we had the big old uh, cameras that we used to have, and they went in the battalion cars. So now we show up to do our tactical 360, especially as a rapid intervention team, the officer is still going to be at the command post. But one of the things we would do automatically is send one of the guys to the battalion wagon to grab the old thermal imaging camera. And he would do my tactical 360 with another guy. So I'd have a team of two if I needed them to do something on the rear of the building. If something happened, they would be a team of two working together. And I would send them around with the camera. And now, instead of when you get those new cameras, when you get new equipment, the old equipment being put in a storage shed somewhere to be thrown out in 15 years, when someone goes in and says, what's this pallet of crap? And they throw it out. Think of ways that we can use these things to make us a more efficient department. If you are getting Duke thermal imaging cameras, I mean, 
again, I was out teaching in a place that will remain nameless, but there was a young lady in a small volunteer department. This was three years ago. I'd never seen a thermal imaging camera. Never seen one. Because they ended up having, I showed her one, and we got her into it. They had pancake breakfast to buy one, okay, which is great. But you have to expose the people to the technology, and then with the technology, as it improves, if there are now things out there that can be used in a different way and make us more effective, we have to all look at those things and come up with ideas inside the fire service to be make ourselves better and safer. Excellent. Ryan, I've got a question for you. Uh, when and where are we going to see uh, the results of your research on the hoarding fires? It depends on how long I can stay in my zip code. I've been very blessed to hit the road this year traveling it. So, uh, Bill, I, as a matter of fact, it, you must have been reading my mind. I've got the first article with the first uh, GoPro video will be coming out on Firefighter Nation with the next, hopefully within the next 24 hours. So what you guys will be noticing is a window seal removal for direct room access. So this would be applied for if you identified the hottest part of the house and you want to enter through that window that's blocked full of clutter, you'll see firefighters having difficulty removing the window seal with the GoPro uh, video plus some steel. So this is going to be a really interactive article. Um, past that, I'm getting pretty close to release. I think I have 126 gigabytes a video to show the quad camera, to show the interior of it, and um, I'm being very careful with the kill the flash over permission because I want to give it into, make sure people don't take it out of context. Now, to use the references, if you're going to quote the Bible, don't quote John 1-1-1, read 10 verses above it and 10 verses below it, so that way you have the context in which you're applied. I don't want somebody to, to, to see my video of a, of a fire that goes from 0 to 12, 12 to, to 180 and say, well, we can go inside all hoarding fires. You can't because we had control of the flow path. So hopefully within the next 30 days, you guys will be able to see burn 7-1 was a ventilation controlled environment. Burn 7-2, close your ears, gentlemen. We did a vent enter isolate search using a smoke curtain and a dry chem extinguisher. Woo! Talk about thinking outside the box. That Swedish guy had me by head going, and then burn number three is we did two ignition points, two ignition points, and four flow paths, and we might have lost the building a little bit faster than what we thought we were going to. So the, it's it's amazing, guys, to, to to say that this thing is gonna is gonna blow everything, er, blow your mind is just an uh, an unbelievable. And each one of the vid, each one of the burns, we had those little helmet cameras mounted on the floor, so you see in real time thermal imaging cat time and the exterior view. So I can't wait to get it out of there as soon as I can get it out. So most of this will be on Firefighter Nation. Yep, it'll be Firefighter Nation. We're gonna we're gonna host most of it on uh, ChamberofHorders.com, and I gotta give a huge shout out to Joe Starnes who gave me this opportunity, and it's Project Kill the Flashover, and they're based out of North Carolina, so they gave me the opportunity to spend five days hoarding a house. <laughs> it was it was an interesting experience. Yes, yeah, and it's it's a real problem in in this area here. Uh, we're getting down here to the wire. I think I'm going to let everybody give a final uh, shout out here, and then I'm going to I'm going to close it up with a last word, and, a, and then I'm going to show that. <laughs> so Ryan, if you just want to, anything else you wanted to share with us before we uh, we say goodbye to everybody? Yeah, it's such an honor being on the panel with you folks. I mean, you folks are the ones that I look up to. You guys are the ones that I I, I reference in, in in my research, and to be amongst you is, is is just a huge honor. I would encourage firefighters to reach out. I mean, reach out for what you, NIST, UL, and the folks are doing out there. Don't take it as gossip. I love Chief Halton's speech at FDIC that, I, and I'm paraphrasing that Ben Franklin told him to even challenge the existence of a god. Challenge what you're learning. Put it, apply it to your area. My area is different than yours. And always keep an open mind. We're not trying to take away your leather helmets and and all your specific tasks and tools. But maybe if you put the European helmet on and gas cool, it might work a little bit better. Just staying. Thanks, guys. Right. As long as nobody sees me wearing the European helmet, that's fine. <laughs> Clark, any closing comments, sir? Uh, yeah, training officers, firefighters out there. Um, man, these young guys, please, you know, do your own research. These guys... All of us work for these huge, huge departments. I would love to be able to sit here and tell you that I have personal control over all training of my whole department, but I don't. But I don't. It is up to the firefighters to train themselves. It is up to the firefighters to get on the line. 
and look up Google, look up these videos, everything's posted, nothing's secret. Buy your own books, get subscriptions to magazines, go to FDIC, go to the other conferences, do these things. It is up to you to train yourself and if you're going to sit in your chair and say, I'm going to wait for the department to train me, you're going to be awful lonely. So please help out your training division and take care of business yourself. This is your life, this is your family's lives, this is your brother's lives. Take care of business. Um, again, Keep your eye out for the Terry Farrell Foundation's uh, conference in Las Vegas here in November, and uh, everyone stay safe, please. Uh, great. Dan Shaw, any closing remarks? Uh, yeah, I think a lot of you guys all hammer on the same thing, and I go back to that uh, Aesop fable with uh, familiarity breeds contempt. I think that's what a lot of what we talk about is that when you do something for so long, you, you really stop respecting it uh, because nothing bad ever really happened. And, you know, our job as firefighters is always to – uh, be students, like Mike was saying, be students of this trade and realize that if someone has a, a different view, it doesn't mean they're wrong because everyone has an intellectual curiosity and they're always looking for ways to learn and have different manners in which they learn. And our job really is, as firefighters is none of us turns the sun on and turns it off at night. So you're that person you're probably talking to is the next generation, the next one who's going to be doing this Google Hangout. Uh, so you might as well figure out why they believe what they believe and then you might learn something, but then it's an opportunity for you to teach what you've been taught by your mentors and what your experience has taught you. And you should never really lose that opportunity because that's really what we're here for is to, to do this job, but then also to create that legacy for that next generation of firefighters coming through. Is You can complain about it, but if you complain about it, you're more, more part of the problem than you are the solution. As always, a great, great opportunity to sit and talk with you guys. Look forward to the next one. And speaking of the younger generation, the Hovelmans. Yeah, I, I kind of dovetail off of what Dan just said. Is uh, I think it's important and something I learned the hard way years ago is with, with all this new information and the new tactics and the science is you've got to keep perspective uh, with how you apply it and, and how fast you can change things. For us, it was as simple as, you know, our, our culture was never apply water from the outside. And it was as simple as, explain it to them and once they were able to watch the videos there are times when it's appropriate and it was something as simple as that uh, that made a big difference for a guy in a basement fire that couldn't find the stairs and he, he remembered what he would learned in the video came out and, and was able to reset it then go in and get it so you know it uh, I thought <laughs> you're killing me but I think I think perspective is important whenever you're looking at this stuff because everybody's got different resources different capabilities um, and they're starting from a different place culturally and, and everything else to to make it work. Like Dan and, and Clark mentioned, is you've got to you've got to touch on it and, and work slow sometimes. Not everything's wrong. It's just when do you apply the new stuff? Mike, any closing comments? Yeah, um, I'm going to quote one of my heroes and mentors, uh, Tommy Brennan, who said, uh, "Just because you and I disagree doesn't make me right and you wrong." Okay, and I always thought that was a great line. Listen, question it. They said that. Bobby said, question God. You question everything, okay? You question everything, and you find out what works for you. And if you, from the newest fireman to the most seasoned veteran, chief officer, whatever else, are not a student of the game, you are doing yourself and the brothers and sisters around you a disservice. You keep learning until you die. If you don't, you are slowly dying. Excellent choice of words. Nick, uh, we'll let you wrap things up. And then I think you, uh, we also want to thank Key Firehose again. And, uh, you know, I, I have a sincere love for this hose because it's uh, literally your lifeline. So, Nick, I think you did have a, uh, something in a, uh, some archival footage here of uh, how much I actually like Key Hose. Let's see, where would it be there? I keep talking like okay, a boss. Okay, okay. All right. Um, I want to emphasize the point again of being lifelong students of the fire service. Mike's got, what, well over 30 years. I've got 42 years. My learning curve is like that, like that, over the last few years in terms of building construction, and in terms of modern fire dynamics. And again, it is, there's no shortage. And I think what Clark said also about it's every firefighter's responsibility to educate themselves. Nick, did you want to share something here with us? I'm not exactly sure where this came from, but uh, 
fit, find it a fitting and appropriate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's key holes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was at uh, that was at the uh, uh, a fire conference, and um, yeah, like I say, you know, it's just I find it very comforting to have a a good section of holes near you at all times, and it's uh, so I practice what I preach, my brothers and sisters, and I think we're just about ready to wrap it up. Until next month, this was a great session, Ryan. Thank you so much for being our special guest, Nick, my bow-headed brother. Thank you very much. Brothers and sisters out there in the fire service, stay healthy, happy, and safe, and God bless you all.